Hello, my friends. How are you doing? Today, I want to talk about why you are bad at photo editing and how to resolve that for good. My name is Olivio. I'm a professional designer. And if you want to learn how to get better at photo editing, you came to the right place. So today I want to change the way you think about photography and about photo editing. This is really, really important. I want you to think about it as a story you want to tell to the viewer, a story you want to tell to your audience. Don't think about what kind of photo you want to take. Don't think about what you want to show in that photo. Instead, think about the story. Now, why is that important? And how can a photo even be a story? It is static, it is two dimensional, nothing moves, there's no progression. How can there be a story, right? The thing is, for your audience, it is a story. And for yourself, it is also a story. The photo in the middle between these two, that's just a membrane that you use to transport that story over to the other side, right? So for example, your audience is looking at one point in the picture, then at the next point that attracts their attention, then at the next point. So there's different points there, as you can see, is a time progression. There is a process going on. And in these progressions in between these points, you can tell a story, right? It's very important to understand. Now, the second thing for you as the artist, as the creator, it is important to think about a story because a story helps you to let all of the other elements fall into place. If you think about it as what do I want to photograph and you say, OK, my photo is going to be a portrait of a woman. There is millions of women. There is millions of ways to photograph them. There is millions of angles you can take to photograph that. This does not tell you anything about what kind of photo it's going to be. If you say, I'm going to show this and that should be like dark, like here. And then we have like in this photo, pink and blue and colorful and fun. Again, there is millions of ways to do that. This doesn't tell you anything about what you want to achieve with your picture. But when you think about it as a story, when you have this little movie in your mind of this, OK, this is going on. This is going to be the transition. This is the age that is like futuristic. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be playful. It's going to be this and that. It's a nice person or it's a scary person. It's a dominant person or it's a weak person. Is it um, a scary place? Is it a happy place? Is it about love? Is it about drama? Is it about whatever it is about, right? If you have this as a story, if you see that as a story, the other elements fall easy into place because you can say, OK, I can use these colors to make it happy. I can use these colors to make it scary. I can use these shapes to make it rough and hard. I can make these shapes or use these shapes to make it soft and playful. Right. So you can see from that, if you know the story you want to tell a lot of decisions are then also kind of decided for you. This is the first change I want you to have in your mind. Think about a picture as a story. The second is about the process. Here we are still talking about the artistic process. If you think about all the tools you have, all the filters, all the adjustment layers, all the software tools you can use, all the kind of technical stuff, you might know how to use them, right? And you might have all these software tools, but you still don't know why to use them. That is the biggest question I get asked over and over again. But why are you doing it like that? So here is the next change I want to do in your brain. Think about the artistic process as a puzzle. That is very important not to think about the tools themselves, how they work, what they do. Forget about all of that. I have that story and that story gives me the puzzle on how can I tell it in the best way that is most convincing, that feels the best, that tells it in a way that I've imagined in my brain that brings this movie, this story, this scene alive. That is the puzzle. That is the big question. How can I do that? What kind of means? And you can use the tools in any way you want. Use them right. Use them wrong. Use other tools. Abuse the tools in a way they shouldn't be used. 
But when you get that result you want to have, none of that matters. So just think about the puzzle. How can I solve that puzzle, right? Here is the next thing that is a big problem for you. In solving that puzzle, you don't have experience on how to do that. You don't have the refined decision-making process and you don't have the refined senses to do that. That's a big part of that. You have to put in the work to develop these senses and these decision-making processes, right? So how can you do that? There's a very easy way to do that. Go to Pinterest and select, go to the search and search for pictures you want to take and for stories you want to tell, right? And then decide on these pictures and you can put them into collections. You can make boards where you collect them. And the more you search, the more you interact with Pinterest, the algorithm is learning your taste and is suggesting these pictures to you. So the better Pinterest is understanding you, the better Pinterest can help you to find pictures that you like, right? Now, why is that important for your refinement process of learning how to solve the puzzle? Because all of these works, every single of these pictures is a solution that someone has found to their specific puzzle. This might not be your solution. This is why I say select the ones you like and then you want to analyze them, right? So you can click on a picture. Let's click on this picture here, for example. And first of all, here's another thing you want to understand about Pinterest. This is also why I suggest that when you scroll down, you get more pictures like that. So it's very easy, very fast to build a board with dozens of selections like that. But also you can click on this little symbol down here and this will give you a visual search. So I can go and, for example, decide on just a single part in here, like for example, the hand or the spiral in the hand and it will give me suggestions like that or I can focus on the glasses here and then it will give me suggestions like that, right? So this is very, very helpful in building up a collection of works that are what you aspire to become better at, the process you want to learn about, right? So after you have done that, the next step you want to do is that you copy these pictures over. You can take a screenshot if that works for you. You can also click on the link and see if you can copy this over from the page. Um, in this case, doesn't seem to be there. So we could, for example, take a screenshot. You can just uh, press print on your keyboard and then go over to Affinity Photo and say new from clipboard. And now you have this in here and you can, of course, crop this down. So now you can start to ask the picture different questions about the creative puzzle, about the creative process. Here are some suggestions on what to ask. First of all, start off with the color values. You want to analyze them and see what colors are used. So you can see in this picture, we have blue color values and pink color values, but no other colors. And you will find that to be true for most pictures that you will find online that are edited and good edits, that they have two values at most three different values. Let's look at some examples. Here, for example, we have beige colors that are close together from the values. And then we have these gray blue colors that are close together from the values. And even down there where it's green, it's more of a gray blue than a bright green, right? So everything comes together and has a harmony. Let's look at another example here. Everything has brought together. So we have these kind of orange colors. And then if you look at the clothing, it's not completely white. It's more of a little bit blue color in there. So to have a little bit of a color contrast and at the same time have a color harmony. Let's look at this again. All the colors in there. Look at the green values that you have in the foreground from the dress in the background from the nature. All the brown values from her hair to the leaves. These have been brought closer together and how these two color values correspond to each other. What kind of specific green is being used? For example, in this case, what kind of specific brown is used and how do they look when you put them on the color wheel so they have a harmony, so they have a dynamic with each other. It's not just any kind of brown or reddish orange. It's not just any kind of green. 
These are specific decisions. The more you analyze them, the better you understand them, the better your artistic process is going to be and the better you can solve your artistic puzzle. Because again, if you think about it as a story, you start to easier understand why a specific green, a specific blue, a specific brown can tell a story better or worse. For example, think about green as a color. There is greens that are soothing and relaxing. There are greens that are lovely and passionate. There are greens that are exciting and happy. There are greens that are stressing and warning. So there's a lot of different green values. So figure out what kind of green values are best for what you want to tell as a story, right? Another thing you want to ask yourself is where are the brightest areas in the picture? Where are the darkest areas in the picture? So you can see in this picture that part here is brighter while the other parts here are darker. So you are most likely to look at this area first and then either take the other areas into consideration with your eyes or even ignore them because they are too dark, right? So think about Where's the darker parts? Where is the brighter parts? How does this facilitate? How does this work into building the story of this image? Here is the third thing you want to ask the picture. Where are busy parts in the picture and where are less busy parts in the picture? So you can see here again in this detail, also where the bright area is, we have a lot of small details that catch our attention. We have these kind of geometric shapes here. We have these numbers. We have these graphs here, all this kind of thing that catches our attention where the eyes looking and trying to figure out what is that. And our eyes are always in this kind of pattern searching mode. So this is attracting to our attention. And the rest gets, for example, you can see in the background more blurred. This area up here is busy too, but this area down here is not very busy. Is not much happening in there. So you can see that the attention is guided by the amount of detail and the amount of how that detail is capturing the interest, right? Of course, you can also look at the composition of the work. For example, you can see in that portrait that she is in the middle of the portrait, which makes it rather stable as a position. She could be on the side, which makes it more dynamic. So we have these elements here. Also, her hand is reaching up and the fingers are going towards the glasses. So you have a lot of lines that are additionally pointing towards her face. So there's also a lot of things you can ask about the composition in that picture, right? And all of these elements bring together that they help you understand how other artists, how other creatives are solving their creative puzzles. So here's the third element I want you to think about. This is the technical process of actually taking the picture and how to get better in that kind of process. I want you to get a prime lens. Now, a prime lens is not an expensive lens. A prime lens only means that it's a fixed focal length. So you can't zoom. Why is this important? If you have a range where you can zoom, Again, there is a million different ways, a million different decisions you can take. And this makes it really complicated for you to understand because you still lack the process of going through these decision steps. And this makes it a lot easier for you to take a picture that feels nice and go to a focal length through zooming that is just comfortable for you to take that picture. And this robs you of the chance to actually understand what is going on in the process of picture taking. So if you have a fixed length of your lens, you have to move around. You have to think about you're very limited by that lens. And at first, I know at first it will be painful. It will be uncomfortable and you will be stressed by that. And that prime lens will force you into thinking about how you frame that and Again, start with thinking about the story. This is important because the story gives you a lot of information about, for example, what kind of angle should it be? Is it a dynamic angle? Is it a static angle? Also from the composition. Is it a center focused composition? Is it more on the side? 
Do I put the subject lower or higher in my picture? How do I frame that? Is my camera below that person or subject? Is it above that? Do I maybe rotate my camera a little bit? Should it be horizontal or vertical from the picture? How do you frame that? If you think about the story that you want to tell and you're forced into one focal length that you have, this will give you a lot better understanding on how you get started with this process and you can build up that experience. So don't work with zoom lenses if you want to get better at photographing and photo editing. Start with a fixed focal length lens and start with thinking about the story and you will see that all the other elements will fall into place. Let me know about your results and I'm looking forward to see what is happening after this advice in my Facebook group, which you should absolutely join. Thank you very much and see you in my next video. Bye.